Hello, everyone. My name is Ed Breitswert. I'm the Melanie S. Steele Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease in the Comparative Medicine Institute at North Carolina State College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm also an adjunct professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at Duke University Medical Center. Our topic is Bartonellosis, a history of a hidden pandemic. In the context of disclosures, I hold a patent with Dr. Sushama Santaki at North Carolina State University for media that we develop to enhance the cultivation of alpha proteobacteria which was issued on October 3rd, 2006. I'm also the co-founder, shareholder, and chief scientific officer for Galaxy Diagnostics, a company that provides advanced diagnostic testing for the detection of Bartonella species infections. I do not intend to reference any off-label or non-FDA approved usage in this presentation. Our learning objectives for this module are to describe medically relevant history of Bartonellosis prior to the recognition of the human immunodeficiency virus epidemic of the 1980s. Second objective is to describe the rediscovery of the genus Bartonella as a consequence of the AIDS epidemic. And then finally, to describe the medical history associated with the discovery of cat scratch disease and the eventual identification of Bartonella henselae as the definitive causative agent. So Bartonella species are in the order Rhizobiales and the class alpha proteobacteria. Clinically, what make these bacteria unique in the context of vector-borne organisms is a division time that is approximately 22 to 24 hours. This would be similar to mycobacterium tuberculosis, and as everyone realizes, routine microbiological laboratories are not usually equipped to culture tuberculosis because of the very um, slow dividing time and the very fastidious nature of those organisms, which also applies to Bartonella. The other aspect that makes this genus clinically unique is the fact that Bartonella can infect erythrocytes, endothelial cells, microglial cells, macrophages, and CD34 progenitor cells in the bone marrow. The importance here is that most other tick-borne pathogens, if we talk about Rickettsia rickettsii, it infects endothelial cells, anaplasma phagocytophilum, neutrophils, um, Ehrlichia chaffeeensis, monocytes. So most of the other tick-borne organisms would be localized to a single cell that is either in circulation or in the endothelium. And this electron micrograph is from Dorsey Cordic, a PhD student in my laboratory, um, who studied the role of cats in the transmission of cat scratch disease. Now, we're going to jump back to the late 1980s and early 1900s when evolutionary microbiologists introduced the concept of using the 16S ribosome RNA gene for the genetic characterization of bacteria. And this resulted in a change in the name of a number of bacteria. Um, for instance, Anaplasma phagocytophilum was Ehrlichia phagocytophilum, Neo rickettsia aristoci was Ehrlichia aristoci, and it also moved the Bartonellas out of the genus Rochelamea so completely that the genus Rochelamea no longer exists. So this was the initial reclassification that occurred that separated these organisms out. This is a more contemporary microbial tree of life, and you can see the alpha proteobacteria branch here and the various organisms that all of us are familiar with in the context of Rickettsias, Ehrlichias, Anaplasmas, and Brucella and Bartonella. I want to focus in on the fact that, one, Bartonellas are phylogenetically most closely related to Brucella, and a bacteria in plants that has all three of these have a very similar type four secretion system that injects 
proteins and DNA into the genome. So why that's important is on an evolutionary basis, there was probably a group of common ancestors that caused agrobacterium to end up in plants and Bartonella to end up in mammals and Brucella again to end up in mammals over time. But this is the group that we're most interested in. And I think as physicians, what you were taught about Brucella in the context of diagnostic complexity and therapeutic challenges is increasingly what we're finding in regard to the genus Bartonella. So for the past several years, um, the thought that I've had is Bartonellosis, a modern day hidden pandemic. And I've taken some solace from the words of Aristotle that it's the mark of an educated mind to entertain a thought without accepting the thought. And I would refer you back to the bubonic plague of the 1400s in which we didn't know at that time that there was an animal reservoir, essentially the, the Norwegian rat, or that there was a vector, the rat flea. And as all of us have been taught, nearly a third of the European population died of a bacteria transmitted from a rat via a flea, and that would be Yersinia pestis. Whereas that was not on understood to many years later, and at the time, people thought it was divine intervention that had brought a plague um, to the European continent. So how can you hide a pandemic amongst very smart people? One, you start with an unknown genus of bacteria, which is the reason that we're considering the history of Bartonella in this module today. Secondly, that organism has to behave as a stealth pathogen that's difficult to detect or isolate. Maintain a large and diverse pet and wildlife reservoir in nature, which we'll consider in a subsequent module, and facilitate transmission through multiple vectors and multiple other non-vectorial means. So all these four things are perhaps the most important as to why Bartonella could be a hidden pandemic. So we're going to divide this lecture into three components. One, the historical Bartonellas that were known prior to the AIDS epidemic, what happened in association with HIV, and then how we transition from HIV to cat scratch disease, and then finally conclude with Bartonella and endocarditis as a diagnostic entity that is helping us better understand this genus in the context of complex chronic disease presentations. So the historical highlight that I'd like to start with is Bartonella bacilliformis, which is transmitted by sand flies in the Andes, including Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador. This organism has a extremely important and very colorful history in Peru for several reasons. One is when they built the Pan-Peruvian Railroad through the mountains in the Andes, it is stated that one railroad doctor worker died of aurora fever for each railroad tie that was laid. This is a highly pathogenic organism during the acute infection that induces a fever and a severe hemolytic anemia. But for indigenous people who have immunity or for others who live through the acute infection, they develop these verruga-like lesions, these blood blister-looking lesions, which can be just a few or be multiple all over the body. And the second important historical aspect of this in the context of Peru was Daniel Carrion, when a medical student in Lima, believed that 
this lesion was related to Bartonella bacilliformis and aurora fever as a chronic disease manifestation. So he actually aspirated a verruga lesion uh, from a patient, injected it into his body, and unfortunately ended up dying of aurora fever. So this is historically the first Bartonella that we knew of in the medical literature. The second Bartonella was discovered as a result of World War I and trench fever. And that's because this organism is transmitted by the human body louse. And under the conditions that you see in this photograph where soldiers were essentially dealing with very wet, very dirty um, conditions, the human body louse lice proliferated and as a result, um, we ended up with tremendous losses uh, due to trench fever, which was also referred to as five-day fever or shin bone fever. So I wanna use Bartonella quintana in a historical context to demonstrate how our knowledge of these bacteria can change and has changed rather rapidly. And so this was a case report that we published in 2007 of a 42 year old female uh, equestrian instructor who worked at a riding establishment. She would feed feral cats, which is not an uncommon thing that occurs throughout the United States every day. While feeding these cats one day, she was bitten on the left hand, which became very severely infected, requiring um, surgical debridement of her cellulitis. And she was treated with amoxicillin and ceftriaxone, um, as you can see, for 48 hours and 10 days, respectively. Um, she was having a rather bad October because on October 23rd, she actually backed over her German Shepherd with her truck. Um, and in the process of lifting the dog into the truck, um, she was bitten again and developed a uh, very painful and inflamed lesion at the site of the dog bite. So how we became involved was when the dog was being managed at a veterinarian's office who is a longtime acquaintance and good friend, she mentioned this case to me and we actually tested the woman suspecting that we would isolate Bartonella hensley from the cat as a cause of her cellulitis and other problems that ensued. So we Instead, isolated Bartonella quintana, which was not what we expected. Her serologies, we tend to run against a very large panel now, up to eight different Bartonella species. But at this point in time, we were doing Bartonella quintana, Bartonella vinsonii barkhoffi, and Bartonella hensley. And you could see she was seroreactive as well. We cultured the dog. Um, which was culture negative and sero negative. So it didn't seem like there was a relationship between the dog bite and Bartonella quintana. It took them um, until January 5th in 2005, the next year, before they were able to trap these two feral cats that were in the neighborhood of the riding establishment. We obtained blood from the cats. One had an antibody titer to Bartonella hensley of 1 to 4,096, the other 1024. And both of them were blood culture positive using our enrichment culture platform for Bartonella quintana. So this was super unexpected because no one had ever isolated Bartonella quintana from a cat, and cats had never been implicated in the transmission to humans. We did some additional microbiological characterizations, which is not extremely important for this lecture, but important to close the story out. And the human isolates and the cat isolates were identical by sequencing the 16S, 23S energetic spacer region. The isolates were within one base, similar to the fuller strain, which is the type strain for Bartonella quintana. And 
one thing that was different is the fuller strain contains bacteriophages, whereas we were unable to document the presence of PAP31 bacteriophage gene in these isolates. We followed this young woman, and in January and May, um, she remained BAPGM PCR negative. She was not treated with antibiotics, and she developed no additional systemic illness during the two-year follow-up period. So immunologically, plus her prior antibiotic therapy, seemed to have ultimately uh, eliminated that infection. So how did this and other things over the next several years change our understanding? We, we and French investigators then reported Bartonella quintana endocarditis in dogs. One of my PhD students amplified and sequenced Bartonella quintana from lymph nodes. Bartonella quintana was amplified by French investigators from cat dental pulp and cat fleas. CDC published a manuscript describing humans with lymphadenopathy and seizures from which they were able to isolate Bartonella quintana. And finally, our CAT case report that I just reviewed for you. So I wanted to use this to illustrate that everyone believed that Bartonella quintana only occurred in humans, that humans were the sole reservoir host and that the human body louse was the only vector that could transmit the organism, but that clearly was not the case. So the next historical highlight actually evolved from pathologists in the mid and late 1980s, where they would see patients with vascular angiomatosis and peliosis hepatis that had HIV, and when they looked at these lymph nodes, they could find large clumps of silver staining bacteria throughout the lesion. This is the two examples from David Relman's publication in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1990 of a patient with bacillary angiomatosis, all these proliferative lesions. And again, in this instance, there are numerous, but in some instances, there can only be one or two, or peliosis hepatis, which are, again, these kind of blood blister appearing lesions that are throughout the liver. And we now know that Bacillary angiomatosis can be caused by Bartonella henselae and Bartonella quintana, but to date, peliosis hepatis in humans has only been associated with Bartonella henselae. So what Relman used for among the first time in the medical profession was PCR amplification of that 16S ribosomal RNA gene that we mentioned in regard to the reclassification of rickettsias and Ehrlichias and Bartonellas. And when he sequenced his amplicons out of tissues from bacillary angiomatosis or peliosis hepatis, what he found was an organism that we knew existed, Bartonella quintana, and another organism that no one had ever seen before, which becomes Bartonella henselae. And that'll take us to the history of cat scratch disease, which is obviously very fascinating and interesting in as much as it was first described by Perinod in 1889 as Perinod's oculoglandular syndrome where conjunctivitis and fever and lymphadenopathy um, occurred following a scratch. Then in 1932, um, as far as I can tell quite by chance, both in the US literature and the French literature, cat scratch disease as a triad was described, essentially fever, a history of cat scratch, and regional or non-regional lymphadenopathy. Then in 1945, um, a antigen test was developed where they used lymph node tissue containing Bartonella as the antigen source. Um, obviously, that's not something we would do today and eventually fell out of favor. But what 
was amazing to me is by 1966, Warwick wrote a review on cat scratch disease. So from two cases described in two different continents in 1932 to a review that contained 567 references, suggesting that this is not an uncommon disease um, throughout the United States and certainly throughout the world. The, the next observation was Dr. Weir at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology said that when he looked at lymph nodes from patients with cat scratch disease, he could see silver staining bacilli suggesting that it was a bacteria that was causing cat scratch disease. And at the same institute in 1988, Dr. English made an isolation from a lymph node of a patient with cat scratch disease and characterized that organism and named it aphibia felis. So in 1988, we thought as a result of finding these bacteria that were silver staining and the fact that we had an isolate that we finally found the cause of cat scratch disease. But as you'll see in a minute, that was not the case. So one thing in regard to cat scratch disease that can occur is you develop an inoculation papule. Immunologically, you eliminate the infection at the site of inoculation, and you probably never develop a fever or lymphadenopathy. But in this case, a veterinarian that was vis visiting us from Japan had rescued a feral kitten for company for his pregnant wife. And fortunately, the cat managed to nail the veterinarian and not his wife, developing the inoculation papule, um, lymph, axillary lymphadenopathy, and a fever. So this would be the classical triad of, of cat scratch disease. So how did we go from 1988 and aphibia felis to 1992 with work from Russ Rignery, a rickettsiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Bartonella Henselae and cat scratch disease. So a couple of years after David Relman said that there was this new bacteria that he could amplify and sequence from peliosis hepatis and bacillary angiomatosis lesions from AIDS patients, an isolate was made by a microbiologist in Houston, Texas from an AIDS patient. And that becomes Bartonella henselae Houston 1, the type strain for um, at the AT, ATCC type strain for Bartonella henselae. What Rignery put together was the fact that bacillary angiomatosis and peliosis hepatis had silver staining bacteria. We now had an isolate and we knew that cat scratch disease contained silver staining bacteria. So Russ actually identified a cat that had a high antibody titer. Um, 15 weeks later, they brought the cat back to CA CDC and obtained blood for blood culture. They placed that blood in rabbit brain heart media and in nine days they could see colonies. And then because DNA sequencing wasn't quite as in vogue and was very expensive, they did a technique called PCR RFLP or restriction fragment length polymorphism to say that what they got out of the cat was identical in regard to this pattern to what came out of an AIDS patient in Houston, Texas. The next unfortunate part for me as a veterinarian um, and for cat owners is they brought this cat back three weeks later, did a blood culture, and it was positive again. And it was at a meeting of the American Society of Rickettsiology when I had bre breakfast with Russ that he had explained this new finding and the fact that he suspected that Bartonella would be pretty common in feral cats in the Raleigh, North Carolina region. And he was absolutely right. So Dorsey Cordick came into our lab to try to understand Bartonella and cats and what relationship there was between cat scratch disease um, and this new bacteria, Bartonella henselae. Working with Dan Sexton, an infectious disease physician at Duke, we managed to identify um, 14 patients in a relatively short period of time. So 
these are the cats and you see there were multiple cats here and two cats here. Um, I'll come back to both of those very briefly. And what Dorsey did was we got access to obtain blood for blood culture. At this point, we were using lysis centrifugation blood culture, the same thing that would be used for mycobacterial infections. And you can see that we didn't like what we found because over a matter of 19 months, 21 months, we were able to still culture Bartonella from cats that were associated with the scratch that had induced cat scratch disease in a human. These cats, all of whom were positive, were belonged to a girl that had had three renal transplants at Duke, then developed fever of unknown origin, which was thought to be transplant rejection, then developed chronic gastrointestinal symptoms, and finally developed pulmonary nodules, which was granulomatous pneumonitis, from which Duke scientists PCR amplified and sequenced Bartonella hensilae, and then we subsequently tested the cats, and all six were positive. So one lesson here is it doesn't pay to have feral cats, rescued cats, um, sleeping on the bed of children that have had renal transplants. And then this was one of our interns who during the second year, third year of veterinary school um, had adopted two cats and promptly one of them scratched her and she got cat scratch disease. She then joined us 21 months later from the time of her scratch and both of her cats were still positive for Bartonella hensilae in their blood. So what we knew at that point in time is in veterinary medicine, we had a problem because cats could carry Bartonella for very protracted periods of time. And the longest we followed a single cat has now been three years, belonging to one of our students that remained bacteremic. What a lot of things happened after Russ Rigneri's test became validated for humans and CDC offered IFA testing and ultimately with work from Bert Anderson, PCR testing for Bartonella species, primarily focused on Bartonella hensilae, is in 1994 and 1996, this statement was made, cat scratch disease should be considered as a diagnosis in any patient with intraocular inflammation, essentially neuroretinitis or anterior uveitis. What's changed since then, if you look at recent case reports, is that Bartonella can cause just about any type of ocular pathology that an ophthalmologist might see. And a lot of the emphasis re recently has been on retinal detachment, retinal vascular occlusions. So less on the involvement of the optic disc and optic nerve and more on the involvement of the vasculature to the eye. So in 1993, um, again, about the time that we were all very interested in cats, cat scratch disease, this paper was published by Jackson in the Journal of Public Health. And what was reported at that point was 66 million pet cats, of which now there's at least 90 million in the United States, not counting feral cats, which might approximate 50 million. And the fact that 24 million cases of cat scratch disease were diagnosed yearly with nine outpatient visits per 100,000 and one hospitalized. And essentially $12 million in medical bills, which is not very high for an infectious disease. But the, the major emphasis in this manuscript was the physical and emotional trauma because lymphoma was always a primary differential for particularly children with cat scratch disease, which frequently required a biopsy um, and histopathology. And then ultimately that was replaced with Bartonella serology and PCR. In the context of this $12 million bill, we described one young man uh, in the Journal of Central Nervous System Disease a year and a half ago who's parents in the insurance company paid a half a million dollars in his illness, which was neuropsychiatric in nature, before we grew Bartonella hensilae from his blood. 
So I, I think you can appreciate that the actual cost of Bartonella hensley far exceeds what occurs in association with cat scratch disease. The other really important contribution of the historical literature on cat scratch disease is that everything that's listed here in the context of an atypical manifestation of cat scratch disease can now be diagnosed with more advanced serologic and molecular tests. But also, we have identified every one of these as a cause of disease in dogs and cats for that matter. So Bartonella vinsonii burkholfi that I'll introduce you to in a minute as a cause of osteomyelitis in cats, Bartonella hensley as a cause of osteomyelitis in dogs, Bartonella hensley as a cause of granulomatous hepatitis in humans and in dogs. So more recent publications and review of the human literature has suggested that the atypical manifestations might be closer to 25%. And we suggest that these be referred to as bartonellosis because frequently there's no history of cat exposure or at least no history of the classical triad of cat scratch disease. So that brings us to Bartonella vinsonii subspecies Burkhoffi genotype one. And why this became important is Dorsey Cordic, while the PhD student trying to understand um, Bartonella in cats, got a blood sample from this dog from me while on clinics. And this dog very interestingly had a one-year history. So at the time this picture was taken, a three-year-old female Labrador retriever. You don't have to be a veterinarian to look at this dog's face and realize this is not a dog that feels good. It's a sick dog. And over a nine-month period, this dog progressed from polyarthritis, essentially a shifting leg lameness, to severe weight loss, approximately 10 pounds of body weight, developed seizures, developed a cutaneous lesion, which was biopsied by the attending veterinarian and reported back as a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Then over the next couple months, developed epistaxis and was referred to our hospital when the veterinarian heard a heart murmur and the dog had endocarditis involving the aortic valve um, and the mitral valve, so bivalvular endocarditis. Similar to humans, about 80% of endocarditis caused by Bartonella species in dogs involves the aortic valve, and the other 20% involves the mitral valve or bivalvular generally. So what I can say now is this progression of Bartonellosis over a one-year period is what we would recognize as chronic Bartonellosis in a dog with variations in the symptoms over time. So you'll see that in dogs, Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi was reported by us in the literature in 1995, but the isolate was actually made in 1993. And it was made because in that year, three Bartonella species, Bartonella quintana, again, human body louse, and maybe some other sources, Bartonella elizabethi in rats, and Bartonella hensley in cats, were reported in the human medical literature for the first time as a cause of endocarditis. For this reason, when Tumbleweed came in with this history that was progressive as a very young dog over a long period of time, we cultured the dog on a research basis using the lysis centrifugation technique and that resulted in this isolation of Bartonella vinsonii or Colfi. Now, what we subsequently learned is a lot of Bartonella species can cause endocarditis in dogs, and a lot of Bartonella species can cause endocarditis in humans. And we'll expand upon these species and their reservoir host and their suspected vectors in subsequent lectures. But to finalize this particular lecture, I want to emphasize the fact that we are, as physicians, veterinarians, ecologists, uh, environmental biologists, all in this together, and that 
there is a tremendous overlap between organisms that are in wildlife that make the jump from wildlife uh, into a pet or into a human. And that is obviously very important with the COVID pandemic that we're dealing with currently. And in regard to this translocation, spillover and spillback, I would use the example of the riding instructor who's petting a feral cat, who gets scratched by the cat and should have had cat scratch disease rather than cellulitis and should have been infected with Bartonella hensilae rather than Bartonella quintana. But you can see the interaction between the environment, the cat and the human. And obviously global travel, a consult that I did just an hour ago was a golden retriever that was shipped um, with a bunch of other golden retrievers to a golden retriever rescue in the United States from Turkey, the country Turkey. And they have endemic infections with Bartonella rocha lamea and Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi genotype three, which is what the problem was in this dog that has now arrived in the United States having been shipped to us one month earlier. So we are clearly moving infectious diseases around the world at a rate that is unprecedented in human history. And I believe that Bartonella is one of those that we continue to do that as well. So perhaps the, the take home messages from this particular module is Bartonella bacilliformis is an infection causing Peruvian warts as documented in statues by ancient Incas. Bartonella Quintana was only discovered due to the fact that there were a large number of sick soldiers with trench fever. And for 40 years, it was thought to be a virus until a bacteria was isolated that became Rickettsia Quintana and then Rochelamea Quintana and then ultimately Bartonella Quintana. Bartonella hensilae was discovered due to a large population of immunocompromised HIV infected individuals and other Bartonella species have been primarily implicated as human pathogens in association with endocarditis. We now know that there are at least 40 Bartonella species and many sub subspecies and genotypes that have managed to hide as a global pandemic for thousands of years. And with that, I hope that what we've covered in this module will be of some benefit to you in understanding the history of Bartonellosis and how we have gotten at least up through the early 1990s or late 1990s and early 2000s. And I wanna just acknowledge all the people in my laboratory and at NC State that have helped us with our research over the years and particularly the PhD graduate students who have specifically worked on the genus Bartonella. Thank you very much. These are the references in detail that were listed on the slide um, for you to review as time allows. Again, thank you very much.